the bank that could burst the bubble and has Treasury let the compensation cat out of the bag? Coming up on today's show. Welcome to the Citizens Report for the 13th of April 2022. I'm Elisa Barwick. Joining me today is Citizens Party Research Director Robbie Barwick. Welcome to the show. Thanks, Lisa. On today's show, we're going to be discussing who's really in charge of the banking system and revelations that have big implications for financial victims. Now, don't forget, if you like the show, hit the like button, subscribe and hit the notification bell to be alerted of upcoming shows and new content. Uh, share it as widely as you can, but also make a comment below. That always helps getting get the debate going. Yeah, we want your feedback, plus it helps encourage the uh, algorithm to share it with more people. Um, at least before we begin, it's, what is it, 13th of April, so it means the election's been called. Hmm. Um, so in five and a half weeks' time, we'll go to the polls, and of course the Citizens Party has a slate of candidates, so that's all available on our website and regular viewers would have seen us um, talk about that. Um, we cover this in, the, in our magazine this week. What do we fight for in this election? And basically, we want to fight for the things that matter to change the system, not to just fiddle around the edges to change the system. We need to stop. The, the, the two things we address there is uh, the need for peace, anchored in a better collaborative relationship between nations around the world, which can only be based on a shared commitment to economic development that benefits everybody, not the Wall Street, City of London model of, you know, dog eat dog, you know, uh, divide and conquer, that sort of thing, which is what drives us to war. And the second one is economic justice and progress in Australia, which is really important. Um, we've had 40 years of neoliberalism that smashed us, right? And we've got to reverse that. And the people who introduced neoliberalism were, were really driven ideologues. We have to be really driven patriots to get our country back, right? And that's why we've, we've identified the policies like a postal bank that can put a public banking presence back in and force the, the private banking predators to have to compete and lift their game. We need to save cash in the system. Um, we need to stop bail-in. We need to uh, get compensation for financial victims, which we'll talk about, etc. We've got to fight for these things because... Um, uh, what we have in the major parties, and we were in a bit of a fight with the Labor Party at the moment, is they're too scared to take mm. on the money power. They're too scared to take on the financial vested interest, right? We have to make sure we do that, and we're using this election for it. So we will, you'll see a lot of that in the next five weeks, but we make the point in the, in the editorial, at least, that the day after the election, we'll be doing that just as hard, mm. right? I want to I point out two things also before we go, which I encourage people to... Um, if you, have, if you haven't seen our magazine yet, the Australian Alert Service, you can call in and get a copy. There's two very important articles, one by uh, John Lander, who I interviewed, the former Australian ambassador, I interviewed him a few weeks ago. He's written about the NATO plans for the Asia Pacific. And NATO stands for North Atlantic Treaty Organisation. It's the expansion of NATO that's caused this war in Ukraine. And now those warmongering jerks murderers who, have, who are drowning in blood from 20 years of non-stop war want to have a NATO presence in the Asia Pacific. So mm. John, John Lander has taken that on. But we'll put a link below for this next one. Um, New Zealand's former uh, Minister for Disarmament and Arms Control and Associate Foreign Minister Matt Robertson has come out this week with an article in stuff.co.nz and we've been able to reprint in our article in our, our magazine here. And he has intervened in the war drive himself as a former New Zealand foreign minister, and he's, it is called um, Sleepwalking to War, New Zealand is back under the nuclear umbrella because for, for 30 years New Zealand has actually said, no, no, we don't want to participate in that, we, in this war, this war stuff with you guys. We, don't, we want an independent foreign policy, and suddenly that has changed under enormous external pressure. So um, it's quite remarkable that someone of his standing is coming out as forcefully as he is and saying it. So I, I, we'll put the link to the actual... Uh, online version where people can read that below. And finally, Elisa, I, I thought I should tell the, explain to the viewers why we're looking a bit casual today. Um, this is the week before Easter, so we're shooting the show early, and we've, uh, we're shooting in the afternoon, not in the morning, and uh, we've just finished working hard all week, all day, 
on the uh, putting the magazine to bed. So um, this is how we look when we work, people. Um, <laughs> instead of instead of all dressed up just for the show. So next time you see us, we should be back to normal. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So our first topic: the bank that could burst the bubble. Now this might be a curious title, but what we're going to be discussing is. Uh, for the last year or so, a number of senators have doggedly pursued the Reserve Bank representatives that get sent into Senate estimates to answer their questions. Uh, and these include people like uh, Senator Malcolm Roberts, Senator Jared Rennick, Senator Nick McKim uh, from all different parties. Um, but they've pursued this um, money that the RBA has been putting out in the name of quantitative easing, easing and so forth. But of course, where does it all end up? Because the banks funnel it all into the housing bubble. So they've created this massive speculative bubble beyond uh, what it would have been. I mean, it was growing anyway, but that, this has even made it worse. And so a number of these senators have persistently asked, why can the RBA not direct where the credit goes? Why can we not put it into infrastructure? And, yeah, uh, make it productive instead of where it, where it does end up, which is just propping up banks. Which is having making a worse impact on living standards and so forth. And if we put it into the real economy, it would have a positive impact uh, in a completely different framework. So on the 6th of April was the latest of these interrogatories of the Reserve Bank um, taking place in the Senate Economic Legislation Committee. And LNP Senator Jared Rennick took up the question with... Uh, RBA, the new RBA Deputy Gev Governor Michelle Bullock. Of course, we don't know whether um, these senators caused uh, Guy DeBell's resignation. <laughs> he might have had enough, I suspect. Yeah, yeah no, they, uh, they put him through his paces for a few years and he, he's bailed. Uh, so now it's Michelle Bullock is answering the questions. But before we go to the clip, I have to say, you can see in these answers that she actually came in prepared for these questions because yeah. you're right, it has been a theme and it's finally sinking into the RBA. We better own up here. And she's been in there with Guy DeBell as the backup yeah. on in the various other hearings. Um, but I just want to draw attention to this the key element that Rennick asks, and that is what would the RBA do if the government directed it to create money through a quantitative easing program to build infrastructure such as dams, power stations and roads. Now, you know, there's a lot of beating around the bush that goes on, but you'll see when she gets to the ultimate answer, uh, it is very interesting. So in, in regards to trying to control inflation, rather than limiting demand, which is one way to do it through tightening interest rates, the other way is to increase supply uh, which we could do via an expansive quantitative easing program. Now, I know you've just spent $300 billion on shutting down the economy for the last few years, uh, helping to fund that shutdown. Couldn't, what if um, the government directed you to create money through a quantitative easing program to build infrastructure, like dams, like power stations, like roads, that would increase the supply of essential services and therefore push down the price of essential services? Infrastructure building is a matter, I think we've discussed this before, Senator, but infrastructure building is a matter for the government. Oh, I accept um, that. Sorry, sorry I accept that. I'm it's talking about the funding bank. of it. Rather than borrowing money from offshore, which is then going to put more dollars as we swap, swap dollars out for foreign currency buys Aussie dollars, right? Shouldn't we expand our own volume of money in the system so that we also keep our dollar low? Because I notice. Uh, 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 Chris was talking before about manufacturing. If we let that dollar, if we raise interest rates and that dollar goes up above 80 cents or even in the high 70s, that makes us less competitive for manufacturing. So we need to be very careful that when we raise int uh, interest rates, the dollar doesn't go with it and then that reduces our capacity to compete uh, in terms of manufacturing. Because if there's one thing we've learned out of COVID is that we need to bring it back manufacturing back onshore. And if we don't expand our own volume of money in the system, OK, our dollar is going to increase. The challenge here, Senator, is that um, what matters is the real exchange rate. And if you have permanently accommodative monetary policy, uh, rising inflation, as you referred to earlier, then you don't increase your competitiveness either. So it, it, it's, it's not so, a simple... So are you saying you won't? Sort of either or. No, because if inflation rises, then you decrease your competitiveness just as if your exchange rate had risen. It's not... It's not an either or. Right? You don't have a, a low exchange rate and a very accommodative monetary policy and low interest rates. If that ends up with higher inflation, then ultimately your competitiveness 
is compromised as well. But that Chris, I don't on... know if you wanted to add anything. But sorry, I, I dispute that. That depends on how you spend your money. If you build more productive assets that supply more essential services, okay, you will increase the supply, right? So that is one way to control inflation, and it will increase our competitive, competitive, uh, competitiveness against uh, foreign uh, competition. Now, I, I, for the life of me, can't understand why we can spend $300 billion to shut the economy down, but we can't spe you know, use quantitative easing to fund the building of infrastructure in this country. But, well, I can just add, if you'd like, I mean, I think, um, as Michelle already said, really building infrastructure is a matter for uh, governments rather than the central bank. And uh, I just note that there are pretty extensive plans to be doing that and finance. Yeah, okay, so, but that wasn't the original right, question. So, sorry, you're going off. My original question was what if you were directed to fund it via a quantitative easing program? So not, we're not disputing about whether or not we should build infrastructure, it's how it gets funded. If we borrow a billion dollars from offshore to build a dam, the first billion dollars we create in wealth goes back offshore. If we fund it here domestically, the first billion dollars we create, we keep here. We shouldn't be paying other countries billions of dollars a year to use their printing press when we've got our own here. That's my point. OK, ultimately, Senator, uh, that's a matter for the government. Um, it's not typically the way that we work here, um, and most central banks around the world do not work in this way. We do not directly fund governments. Um, there are some countries where that happens, but it's not typical uh, in any advanced economy. Um, there is a, a typical um, divide between fiscal policy and monetary policy, and that's typically the way it's happened. The pandemic was, in fact, a very different situation. And, but if the government directed us to do that, then that's a conversation that would have to be had. Well, oh, sorry, I have to dispute that again. The Federal Reserve have been buying bonds, uh, as has the ECB and as has the Japanese Central Bank for at least a decade. The US started it after the GFC. So I dispute, dispute and the ECB, I should say, um, ha has been buying bonds and has been using monetary policy to be funding government spending. So it's not unusual. Uh, and indeed, it was done back here in 1810 with Lachlan Macquarie, Lachlan Macquarie when he rocked up. Um, so it's not an unusual thing. It's a question of whether you want to use, whether you want to use a, a, another country's printing press and use their currency and pay them for their paper, or we use our own paper and keep the interest and the wealth created from that paper if we invest it productively in our own, on our own shore. So um, finally, she got to the point and no, she, she got it. She, the, the answer was, if you're directed by the government, what are you going to do? Mm. And of course, she has an option to say, we're independent. The government can't tell us what to do. She actually doesn't say that. She says, we'll have to talk about it. Yeah. If the government directs us, we'll have that conversation, which is, you know, a very interesting admission, although that's not the biggest bombshell we have to reveal no. in this segment today. So stay tuned. Um, but I just want to mention, you know, the arsenal we have is actually building here because um, here they've admitted, OK, there's going to be a, this is going to be a matter of contention. We'll have to have that conversation if it comes to it, if the government decides to demand this. What we also have in our arsenal is the preamble of the Reserve Bank Act 1959. And a number of the senators have cited this when they've come up um, in discussion in various estimate sessions. It com this preamble commits monetary policy to fostering, quote, the economic prosperity and welfare of the people of Australia. And that's very important because monetary policy has to be directed to that objective. And, and, and the, 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 there's two sort of main premises on which the, these uh, sceptical senders are coming from. One is before 2008, no one knew about this capacity of central banks just to create money out of nothing, right? And of course, every time before that, governments have said, oh, we've got no money for all these important things. And suddenly when the banks are in trouble, the central bank just invents it, mm. right? And the second one is the Reserve Bank has created Australia's, more than any other institution has created Australia's property bubble. It has fostered this thing. So the, ha the, ha the unaffordable housing that's destroying our economy, they've created it, right? And that is not, what's the, what's the wording? That is not... Uh, fostering the economic prosperity oh. and welfare of the people no. of Australia, mm -hmm. and so that's that's the, that's what these senators are trying to get at. You're you're clearly doing causing this 
why are you still doing it when this is your, you've been told you've got to contribute to the economic prosperity and welfare of Australia? Now, there's another thing we have in our arsenal if this conversation that Michelle Bullock referred to has to be had, yep. and that is uh, a procedure outlined in the Reserve Bank Act 1959 in Section 11 for resolving disputes between the RBA and the government over monetary policy. If the government comes to the RBA and says, we're directing you to do X, Y, Z, um, what this part of the Act allows for is for the government to determine policy in the event of a material difference. And that wording comes from statements on the conduct of monetary policy which are uh, issued regularly by uh, the Treasury and the RBA as joint statements. So that's what they acknowledge, um, that the government can be the determinant of the policy uh, if there's a dispute over it. So effectively, if the government directs the RBA to issue credit for the economy, the government will prevail. And as we'll come back to later, this is likely an artefact from the 1937 Banking Royal Commission, uh, which was the big fight that took place um, you know, after the Depression era, when there was questions about uh, whether the government could create credit to have um, development programs to build out of the Depression. Probably works. Um, now... Thirdly, and this is um, where we get into the interesting part, on the 16th of February in Senate estimates hearings, Green Senator Nick McKim drew attention to existing Reserve Bank powers to, quote, direct the class of loans that banks can make, which is contained in the Banking Act 1959. And this pertains to what you said about the RBA allowing um, the housing bubble to explode because they don't put any regulation on the banks and where their loans go. But of course, we did once do that and it's still in the law. So Nick McKim drew attention to Section 36 of the Banking Act 1959, uh, which Michelle Bullock um, and at that time, Guy Debole was still there because this was in February, uh, didn't know much about at all. They no. didn't know that they were even mentioned by it. So they had to take the question on notice. But what Section 36 of that Act states is, number one, where the Reserve Bank is satisfied that it is necessary or expedient to do so in the public interest, the Reserve Bank may determine the policy in relation to advances, which means loans, to be followed by uh, authorised deposit-taking institutions. And secondly... Without limiting the generality of Subsection 1, the Reserve Bank may give directions as to the classes of purposes for which advances may or may not be made. And Nick McKim uh, stated that this would allow the Reserve Bank to direct a bank to limit the number of housing loans it makes with any particular basket of money that it might get, for example, from the RBA's money printing. Furthermore, he said it could be used to, quote, establish a different cash rate for lending for housing as opposed to lending for business. And in fact, that is something that um, the 1937 uh, Royal Commission did take up in terms of both the interest rate question and um, the advances policy. Uh, the 1937 Royal Commission stated that in order to promote a wise distribution of credit, the Commonwealth Bank can advise trading banks as to the directions in which it is desirable in the national interest that advances should be made. So again, in the national interest. Um, now, the, the RBA, though, didn't really say too much about this policy at the time, but they came back on the 1st of April uh, on notice with their answers to the question, and this is where some interesting revelations came about. Um, they acknowledged that uh, the Reserve Bank indeed does have this power, noted in Section 36, but they said that this power dates from the era prior to the deregulation of the financial system in the early 1980s, when there were wide-ranging controls on the financial system. And that that government guidance of bank lending had ended in June 1982, uh, and monetary policy, they said, now operates by influencing interest rates. And that's about it. Um, now, the RBA wanted to um, give some kind of explanation as to what Section 36 specifies, but they couldn't find any guidance in the <laughs> historical documentation. Yeah, that's extraordinary itself. I, I mean, there's, there's too much of this to talk about, really, but I do, I do want to say that um, 
we, you know, we use this term neoliberal, Elisa, to describe this ideology that changed the way the governance of banking worked in Australia, privatised all the banks, deregulated the banking system, etc. And what we've discovered in this clause is the neoliberals were also mm. lazy because they, <laughs> they left a clause in the, bill, in, the, in the Act that the current people running the bank, as you said, didn't even know about it, mm. right? But it's there, and what you're about to read actually tells you how powerful this clause is. Mm. So to, to give an interpretation to that clause, they went back to the, uh, the preceding bank legislation before the 1959 Banking Act was the 1945 Banking mm. Act, which was basically um, part of Ben Chifley's intervention to ensure that banks would be the servants of the economy. So they yep. went back to an explanatory memorandum from the same clause which ends up being Section 36 in the 1959 Act. Uh, and that clause explaining the version in the 1945 Act says the following. Regulation 7 of the National Security Wartime Banking Control Regulations provides that, quote, in making advances, a trading bank shall comply with the policy laid down by the Commonwealth Bank from time to time, unquote. And that was, of course, the central bank at the time. This power has proved helpful under wartime conditions and will be useful as a continuing power to ensure that at all times the credit resources of the nation are put to the best use and that the making of advances by banks does not lead to an unbalanced expansion of credit in any particular field. This clause will enable the Commonwealth Bank to determine the policy in relation to advances or loans, which is to be followed by all banks without giving it control over individual advances. Yeah. And Sorry. What we have confirmed with legal experts looking at the legislation, even though that, what I just yeah. read out, refers to the 1945 Act, that power is still in the 1959 Act. So that still applies. And, what, and just to people are confused, by 1959 Act, well, it's the 1959 Banking Act that's still in effect today. Yeah. They just keep amending it from time to time, but this power is still in there. Now, what, here's what that means. The government can tell the Reserve Bank what to do, and the Reserve Bank can tell the private banks what to do. Right? They can't tell them, you must approve that loan to Joe Bloggs. But what they can say is, stop loaning so much for, for mortgages, loan more to small business. Right? They can absolutely say that, but they don't. And so what their excuse was, oh, that guidance ended in 1982. Well, we don't care if your policy says that guidance ended in 1982. We're trying to identify what can be done so we can identify what should be done. And then it's in the, we have to demand the government mm. explain what will be done, right? Because if you're, if you're someone, if you're a young person who's desperate to buy a house and you're clearly marked, priced out of it, it's because there's a bubble. Right? It's got to be intervened on. It's a distortion in the economy. And these clowns say, oh, this is just the free market. No, it's not the free market. It's a bubble. The Reserve Bank created this bubble. They created it with the excuse that they actually used in that answer, Elisa, which is interest rates. They kept dropping them and dropping them and dropping them and dropping them and dropping them. Right? The app played a role by this special thing called risk weighting that encouraged banks to make loans as well. But um, before they dropped interest rates, the Reserve Bank in 1998, before the bubble began, actually changed the way it counted, it measured inflation. And if they were measuring it by the old way, we would have had a much higher inflation rate all these years, and they wouldn't have been able to drop interest rates as much. Hmm. So they cooked the books on inflation, dropped interest rates to the floor, created a bubble, right? If you're an elderly person who's got your home, that's great, except you know the effect the low interest rates are having on you, you don't get income from your investments anymore. So you get, you get pushed in the hands of charlatans out there, the predators, who then create that whole um, mess of financial victims. So you've got your own, your own problems to deal with. But families, the, the, the family unit that's the bedrock of any nation is being priced out of existence by this housing bubble. And what this is, when they say, when the government says, and when the Reserve Bank says, we can't do anything about it, that is rubbish. The power is in the law for them to absolutely be able to do something about it. And then, you know, back to Senator Rennick's point, um, Elisa, is while we're making the Reserve Bank do something about the property bubble, we can also make the Reserve Bank actually, if they can conjure up all this money, it's over, 
It's, you know, it's nearly $400 billion since mm. the start of the depression. That <laughs> depression, yeah. <laughs> the, dep the pandemic Correct. depression, right? $400 billion. 400, that's what the Reserve mm. Bank has created through quantitative what, what easing. What could we have done with that? What if a fraction of that had gone into mm. infrastructure, right? And that's, that's, the, uh, that's where we're now at the point where these are, there's no arguments against this anymore. Yeah, I mean, it's just the, the blockages of the neoliberal ideologies and the RBA admitted in, this, in their answers that it was the 1981 Campbell yep. inquiry that inspired these changes, which was just a consensus between the government and the RBA to let the private financiers run riot. And we're about to, the next topic, we're about to talk about the consequences of that. And before we do, just, the, just because you raised it, I want to give the specific of what happened in the 1930s, which, is, which defined the history ever since. So, you know, if you go back before the 1930s, King O'Malley, um, fought for the Commonwealth Bank and we established the Commonwealth Bank in 1912. It was brilliant in World War II, but then between the wars, the private banks got put on the board and they totally neutered it, made it useless. But then, then the depression hit and we had a brilliant treasurer named Ted Theodore in the Scullin government. And he knew the power of banking. He knew what the Commonwealth Bank could do. And he ordered the Commonwealth Bank increase the money supply mm. so that we can build, put people to work. You know, we had 33% male unemployment, put people to work in public works. And the chairman of the Commonwealth Bank, Sir Robert Gibson, in 1931, said, I bloody well won't. And this, said, this, this raised the question, who's in charge? Yeah. The democratically elected government or the appointed head of the, the Commonwealth Bank? And that's what led to the 1937 Royal Commission. And it's what defined the career of Ben Chifley. And Ben Chifley participated in that Royal Commission. The Royal Commission itself said it has to be the government in charge. That's the, that's the, the foundation of Australian banking policy was set by that Royal Commission that the, that, that the ultimate authority over the banking system is the elected government. Mm -hmm. um, ben Chifley, when he took uh, office in the 40s as Treasurer and then as Prime Minister, he put that into practice. Mm -hmm. And what happened from the 80s onwards, they sabotaged all that. And, the, and, the, and I, can, I can tell the story now. John Alexander, the former um, uh, member for Benelong, who's, re who's retired for this election, the first time I met him, he told me about how he headed a, a, a committee looking into the housing bubble. And he was so alarmed by what he saw, he said to the Prime Minister, who is now, the man who's now the Prime Minister, Scott Morrison, who was then the Treasurer, he said, what are we doing about this? What are we doing about this housing bubble? And Scott Morrison, the Treasurer, said to him, that's not our responsibility, that's APRA's. And right there, what he expressed in his head is, we, the democratically elected government, are not in charge. Unelected banking bureaucrats are. In other words, you don't have democracy when it comes to finance, right? There is no democratic authority over it, and that's a banker's dictatorship. Mm. And this is what Chifley and the Labor Party, but the 1937 Royal Commission um, uh, established the principle that's not the case. And now we've discovered in yeah. this act that the law is still on our side. We yep. just have to demand these clowns use it. There's something that they just didn't quite get rid of. And yep. um, good on these senators for pursuing this. And I encourage them to pursue it more. They're doing a great job. And we're at a historical break point, yep. which could change everything for the future of this country. So on to our next topic. Has Treasury let the compensation cat out of the bag? Uh, now, we put out a media release on this subject on the 12th of April. Labor's Stephen Jones is wrong. Treasury confirms ASIC victims can apply for Act of Grace compensation. Um, now, you, I think, talked on the show last week about the Western Australian-based victims of the Sterling First Who met with Stephen Jones. Scam. Yep, yep, meeting with Stephen Jones. And they asked him whether he would commit, if Labor's elected... Uh, to paying them this uh, act of grace payment because these are this is an extraordinary situation given these are elderly people. Many of them have already died while waiting for compensation. So it needs to be done urgently. And they're in this position because of ASIC. That's, that's right. That's the bottom and line. And Stephen Jones's answer was no. no. And then he had all these um, meal and mouth excuses. Now, um, uh, so we've had a major breakthrough since then thanks to uh, a, develop a newspaper report over the weekend, which I'll tell you in a minute. Just to preface it though, um, look, there's hundreds of thousands of financial victims out there, Elisa, and the problem that um, we have is a government that has is, that is, uh, done everything in its power to make sure that the impulses coming out of the Royal Commission have been squashed, 
right? So, um, and they got rid of the previous chairman of ASIC who was trying to lift ASIC's, ASIC's game, James Shipton, and they brought back the guy who weakened ASIC in the first place, Joe Longo, and put him in charge, right? Um, and Joe Longo, the Sterling First case, when you consider Longo wasn't even there, his performance in that hearing on the Sterling First case, why is he, who wasn't, it's, it's the one thing we can't blame him for, why is he covering ASIC's ass, right? Because what they don't, they, they know that this, is a, this case is their Achilles heel. Because if ASIC can behave in this way and use these excuses not to police the system and it results in this carnage among these really vulnerable elderly people and they're not accountable for it and the government's not accountable for it, then we can have, we'll have no change, right? We will, we will still have this phenomenon where Australia is what the, a previous and even earlier chairman of ASIC called a paradise for white collar criminals, right? But they know that when the public hears about this case, they're mad. That's why a little collapse led to such a big inquiry, mm. right? Now, so he said, uh, but the problem, one of the, one of the, one of the reasons we're, reminded, we're in our party and not in the Labor Party, even though we hate the Liberals so much, is because, and, and even though we love Australian Labor Party history, we're always talking about it, it's because that's not the Labor Party anymore. And in fact, when it comes to finance, they are pathetic mm. and some of them treacherous, right? They're in the tank. Um, so... And because they're pathetic at best, the government gets away with this. You need, at minimum, you need a Labor Party that's going to go to war on this issue and then really expose the government for what they are. And unfortunately, that's what the Citizens Party has to do, right? So um, every now and then, though, you have a, a, uh, a good breakthrough. Um, Mr Jones said what he said, and we took him to task last week. Well, over the weekend, The Guardian reported that the former Speaker of the House of Representatives, Tony Smith, I'll We'll put this on the screen, you can hold up his photo there. This is the headline from The Guardian. Government urged to allow ASIC to decide claims against itself after investors left in limbo. And Tony Smith, now that I come to think about it, I reckon he was actually a pretty good speaker of the House of Representatives because you can see, you can see some footage there sometimes where he actually sits Morrison down and, and you know, Morrison's the leader of his own party, but he sits him down and makes him behave properly in the House, not when he blasted Christine Holgate, unfortunately. Um, but Tony Smith uh, resigned the speakership at the end of last year, and now, as of now, he's retired from Parliament. But he spent his last few months as the chairman of the uh, Joint Committee on Corporations and Financial Services. And a Labor Member of Parliament, Julian Hill, asked questions to the Treasury on notice earlier this year about a case called Prime Trust. And Prime Trust is a collapse, again, involving elderly people in aged care, an aged care scheme, but this is a $500 million collapse, mm. right, affecting hundreds of people. Now, that tells you straight, like, that's an example, actually, of why we say the sterling collapse is right, it's rather small. This hasn't led to an inquiry, right? Um, but what's similar about the two collapses is ASIC is clearly at fault, because in the case of this collapse, prime um, ASIC allowed the man in charge of the scheme that collapsed to register for a financial services license, even though ASIC knew he was dodgy. Mm. By, its, by ASIC's own actions against him before that, ASIC knew he was dodgy, he was still able to register for this scheme. Now this one stinks to high heaven because it was pretty well connected. Dr. Michael Wooldridge, the former Liberal Party Health Minister under Howard, he was on the board of this scheme, right, etc. Anyway, $500 million is lost. So the long-suffering victims of this collapse have narrowed it down that their problem is ASIC and they have said, they've demanded, look, you owe us compensation. Now there's a compensation scheme, Elisa, called the Compensation for Detriment from Defective Administration, CDDA. And um, uh, they've said to ASIC, your administration was defective, you owe us $200 million in compensation. And ASIC says, we can't decide on that because we once had a power we could and that expired in 2015. So we can't decide on that. And then this group of victims has gone to the treasurer and said, you're the treasurer, you decide. And the treasurer says, we can't decide on that because that would interfere with ASIC's independence. And so it's a catch-22 that's left these victims in limbo. Um, Julian Hill asked this question on notice to ASIC and said to the Treasury and said, your, your reasoning makes no sense why Treasury can't decide on that. 
And then Treasury came back with an answer to the questions on notice, backing up their position. But then Tony Smith has intervened. And, I, and when I read this, the first thing I thought is, why are these politicians so good when they're on their way out? Mm. <laughs> <laughs> right? They don't, they, they don't do much when they're in there, but suddenly on their way out or when they're after they're out, they'll say something that's quite productive. Um, but he's, he's intervened here and he's written a letter to Josh Frydenberg. And I just want to read... Um, it's a little bit dry, but I'll read it and explain what it means because I'm building up for the punchline. Mm. <laughs> he said, the committee also notes that, tre and this is as the, in his capacity as chairman of this committee, he said, the committee also notes that Treasury's advice that the Treasurer is unable to decide claims against ASIC under the CDDA scheme has failed to adequately address the question as to why the Treasurer cannot do so and simply pay any compensation from consolidated revenue, thus avoiding a direction to ASIC to pay compensation. So he says, if you don't tell ASIC to pay it out of its money, you pay it out of the government's money, there's no limitation. Mm. Cut, cut the crap. Mm. And when he says it, the other thing people should know about Tony Smith is he used to work for Peter Costello before he got into Parliament, and Peter Costello was the Treasurer. So Tony Smith is very, he's worked in the Treasurer's office, right? He knows of which he speaks. And he's saying, your excuse doesn't fly. Now, this is important because this, gets stu this stuff gets really arcane and you're digging through the rules and whatever because what you, the reason you have to do this is because you're up against these agencies that don't want to take responsibility for their screw-ups even though hundreds and thousands of people are being driven to early graves through financial ruin and sheer embarrassment and their suicide and all that kind of stuff. No, no one, no, we're not going to take... The financial institution, if it's involved, has usually gone bust and they can't pay and no one wants to pay even when, especially, it's a question of ASIC. And the worst part that really bugs me is these people, like in charge of ASIC or Josh Frydenberg, it's not their money. Mm. They're not saying, Josh Frydenberg, pay us out of your back pocket. This is government money. If you can't see that there are cases when that has to be compensated, then you know there's something really wrong with you. So what's the real issue here? They're protecting the system that protects the banks. That's the real issue. Mm -hmm. However, in this letter that... Tony Smith took exception to from the Treasury where they had all these excuses why they couldn't do what he said under, the, under this thing called the CDDA that, that I told you. I want to read, they, have a, they insert a line here that set off fireworks in my head, right? So they're basically saying, look, no, no, can't do it, too big a deal. But then they said, but then, they, then they're explaining there's an alternative way to get compensation. They're offering them an alternative. And what's the alternative? Remember Stephen Jones was asked, can we get to, by the sterling victims, can we get an act of grace payment? Will you, the government, commit to an act of grace payment for us? And he said, no, no government would commit to compensating you through an act of grace payment. Well, the Treasury said two months ago, quote, the act of grace scheme is similar to the CDDA scheme and is capable of considering ASIC-related claims including those relative to defective administration by ASIC. Case closed, mm -hmm. Your Honour. Mm -hmm. Right? These people, they, we showed it in the first case. We've now showed it in the second case. The law is actually on the side of the people who want to fix the system. Right? Um, they just can't get their stories straight, etc. They are BSing the public in order to protect the system that protects the banks. So we will keep pushing this mm. very, very hard. We're gonna push Labor very, very hard to, to commit to a change of their policy on this because it's unconscionable, because they are vulnerable victims, Elisa. Um, 20 of them have already died, right? And if we can make the breakthrough, as I said last week, on this case, it sets a precedent for all cases. And then yes, it'll involve a lot of money and the government will have to set up a fund and will have to tap the major banks and make them contribute to the fund, etc. We have to spend whatever time is required for the foreseeable future addressing this. Because, you know, before, 19, before the year 2000, you didn't have hundreds of thousands of financial victims languishing around Australia hmm. it, as a systemic problem. You would have a, a collapse here or there and whatever. But we've got, this is a systemic problem. We didn't have that before. This is, this is a legacy of having a weak um, regulator that's, that protects the banks, right? And we have to change that. And when we do, we've still got to address the just, we're still to provide justice to the victims and now we know that the law is on our side to do it. Yep, and this intersects and taps into the same issues we were talking about in the last topic because it's only, which is why it's a central element of our 
Australian Citizens Party campaign is by changing the top-down systemic framework yep. that you can begin to address all the problems that come below that um, you begin to get the economy moving in the right direction and a lot of these problems are taken care of through well, the Well, you know, com confidence is a big part of how an economy actually does function and where our policy is about injecting confidence back into it. Yep, so we need to get these policies in place. So get out there on the campaign trail with real ideas and bring the pressure to bear on your MP, your local MP, and the candidates that are running to start to get in tune with these ideas. Yeah, one last thing before we sign off. Um, as we've announced the last couple of weeks, uh, Julian Assange's extradition is up on the 20th, which is Wednesday next week. We're recording this Wednesday this week. So unfortunately, Easter's in the way, but the instructions we gave last week about making those calls, keep mm. it up until, until Wednesday, until the end of Wednesday. Keep hitting these politicians with phone calls. Um, you won't get much over the week, Easter weekend, obviously, but before Leave and messages, after. messages, yeah, doesn't you can, matter. No, exactly. Flood them. Um, this is our last-ditch attempt to uh, make these politicians grow a spine and do the right thing. Mm. So call us for more information. Like and share the show. Uh, that's about all we've got time for. Thanks, Robbie. Thanks, Lisa. Happy Easter. Happy Easter, everyone, and we'll see you again next week. Authorised by Robert Bowick, Citizens Party Melbourne.